So I'm going to stay. This will be my last time I'm speaking specifically about the resurrection. I mentioned it to you that uh, growing up as a Christian, I, I really didn't understand the resurrection the way I do now. And that it's not just Jesus rose from the dead. It's that that same spirit lives in us. And I want to just drill down a little bit on how that might apply to specific things in our life. That you know, Let's just say that you've, you've uh, identified a problem in your life could be an addiction to something that you know is not good for you. You know it's not lining up with the word, and, and that could be creating a lot of frustration. Well, those, those, that could be a spiritual attack. Often it's a spiritual attack. The addiction is taking over, and we like to say in our uh, prayer ministry that we don't want to fix it. We want to crucify it and let God raise up the new you on the other side that won't be tempted to do that anymore, okay? So I want to make it personal about the idea that you bring things to death and you bury them and then Jesus raises up the new version of it for us as well as, as what he did for him. Okay, that's the promise that we have. Beauty for ashes, graves into gardens, addictions into people who can counsel other people out of addictions, right? John Manning, so good to see you. Praise the Lord. Glad, so glad you're here, man. Good to see people that we haven't seen in a while. Anyway, so let's just pray and ask the Lord to give us revelation on this. Father, we're so grateful that we can spend time in this beautiful place together as a church, that we live in a country that allows us to worship openly and freely, and that we just claim that promise is not going away, that we will be able to, to worship you freely. And we just ask you to put distractions aside, that, that you'd help us just to discipline our heart, to hear what you want to say to us this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the bread of life, right? The word of God. So um, I just wanted to remind you, this is a chart I showed last week because on the church calendar, we're in that time between the resurrection and the next big feast is what? 50 days later is Pentecost. And that's very uh, well known in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, it says that the disciples were in that upper room and, and uh, it's a sound like a mighty rushing wind. I don't know that it was actually a wind. It just said a sound like a mighty rushing wind came into that room and all of a sudden they were given a miraculous gift that they could speak in a language that they never learned. A known language that they never learned and that was just really amazing to everybody there. And we want to, we want to just remember the, the calendar in scriptures there for a reason. The reason God said we're going to have this feast of Passover and I want you all to come to Jerusalem. And then we're going to have the feast of, of uh, they called it uh, the giving of the law. Their, their version of Pentecost was the giving of the law. When Moses went up and got the law and brought it down, they were celebrating that. We celebrate the fact that Jesus went up and sent the Holy Spirit down, right? So that our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to go to a temple. We are the temple. And the same Spirit that is in heaven in the throne room is sitting inside of you, but you have to access it. You've got to give place to it because the Lord is not going to override your, your free will. Right? So, like, personally, I had to learn to pray because the only person getting, nobody was getting hurt more by me not praying than me. Right? So this idea that it's this drudgery to pray is just a wrong picture. Wow. We want to ask the Holy Spirit, help me to understand. And he even says in Romans chapter 8, when I don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays through me and with me and, and makes it that double blessing that we have. Okay, so... I'll send this to you if you want. You can email the church and we'll, and we'll get that to you. But my text verse is from Romans 1, uh, verse 4. And you know Romans has 16 chapters. It's one of the biggest books and, and Paul's uh, longest letter that goes into a lot of theology. But right up front, like he's, he's reminding us, I put down, it's God's proof of the identity of Jesus, right? The identity of Christ is this resurrection, new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is... She is a new creation, right? That's the same as resurrection. It's that old that passes away and the new thing that comes. Now, can that old man resurrect itself? Yes. So you want to continue to practice disciplines in the Lord that, that keep that thing dead, right? It can pop back up if we're not careful. So we, we just remain diligent. And, and if our idea is that we have a mission for the Lord, we don't want to go back to that counterfeit affection. And, and we won't because when Jesus went to the cross, he died, okay? He was dead. 
not like some halfway point because he was part man and part God. He was dead. He trusted that the Father was going to raise him from the dead. And often when we're in ministry sessions and, and people have identified a real clear problem, and it's obvious that it's a spiritual issue, it's not just a bad habit that they have, we say, this thing can be taken to the cross and we crucify it and we trust God to raise up the new you on the other side. With me? Yeah. So for an addiction like for me, I, I was for afraid that if I stopped doing drugs and drinking and all those things that I was gonna live in torment for the rest of my life because I was gonna want to do it, but I couldn't do it. So that depending on my willpower, guess what? Doesn't work. Because some stress happens in our life that that thing overrides my willpower. So it's got to be God's power in me. But how many of you have experienced, I'm curious, that you don't even want to do the thing anymore when you've been set free? Stand up. Stand up and wave your hand. You lost the desire to even want to do it, right? What a difference. Oh, my God, what a difference. You're not struggling about it. Now, I'm guessing most of you would say it doesn't mean I could never go back. So I want to be careful because in Genesis it says, Sin is crouching at the door, and it desires to have you, but no, on this side, I've got an immune system. I have to avail myself of that immune system, but I don't ever have to drink again. And I don't want you to think that it's wrong to have a drink. The Bible doesn't teach that it's wrong to have a drink. It teaches it's wrong to be drunk, right? That's clearly in there. Personally, I'd just rather not have the first one. You guys decide what you want to do. But I'm not going to give you my opinion if what does the word say. If you have a glass of wine, it's not a sin. Clearly not a sin, but being drunk clearly is a sin. So that's another day's teaching, right? So it says, he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's so important to just keep focusing on that. Of all the things that would have proven that Jesus was really the son of God, it's that he came alive again and they saw him. And 500 different people saw him, okay? So that's part of, of what we celebrate now, but then the, I would say the more practical part for us is that 50 days later, the Holy Spirit came into the earth, and each one of us now has access, because if you say you're a Christian, Holy Spirit is inside of you, and instead of thinking that, well, I, didn't, I just want to say it simply that the same Spirit that's in the throne room of heaven is now residing inside of us. All right? Don't think of it as that ghostly picture that I gave you a few weeks ago. It's just inside of me now. And what am I going to do with it? Am I going to honor it? That presence that's in my life. Because if I'm tempted to sin and I'm reminded of Holy Spirit's presence, He's not going to, He's going to be grieved if I enter into sin. And I don't want to grieve Him. How about you? I don't want to grieve Him. So I'm not afraid that I shouldn't sin. I'm honoring the presence of God in my life because holy is important, but it's the throne room spirit of miracles, signs, and wonders that's li living right inside of us. And a lot of times when you fast for a while, you're more aware of his presence. Anybody else notice that? Because you're putting your fleshly desires aside and telling your flesh, you're not in charge, flesh. I have a spirit inside of me from God, and his opinion's more important than my flesh's opinion. All right, so let me just go through a few verses here, right? Acts 2, uh, the apostles were defending their belief in Jesus. They weren't backing down in fear. They were very courageous. And he's saying God knew that Jesus would be handed over to you to be crucified and that you would execute him on a cross by the hands of lawless men. Yet it was all part of God's predetermined plan. God destroyed the cords of death and raised Jesus up because it was impossible for death power to hold him as a prisoner. Amen? Death has been defeated by the resurrection. So if you have death hanging over your life, you say, no, it's been defeated. The cords of death have been cut. It can't hold me down anymore. Amen? That keeps me very excited because no matter what I deal with in this life, I know I have a better destiny ahead. And while I'm here, I want to be as effective as I can for God. Sin is going to stop that from happening, so no sin, I'm, I'm not giving you any door into my life. doesn't mean I still couldn't make a mistake, for sure, but there's just certain things that the world thinks is important, and God says, that's an abomination to God. You don't have to follow the world's way of doing things. Daniel did not eat the diet of the Babylonians, and we don't have to eat the diet of the secular culture that we're living in right now. We eat the word, eat this book. 
and, and memorize scripture and use worship music to keep it going in your spirit because you have so many gifts inside of you. It's like an arsenal so that when you come into a situation, and there's a lot of hurting people right now just due to COVID alone, I mean, my prediction is they don't even realize how badly they're hurting from being locked down for 13, almost 14 months now. But when we start to re-engage, which frankly, I think this is amazing, right? It's so beautiful. We're in May. I personally, I just feel a lot of stuff lifting off the culture because they're just getting outside and they're like so sick of lockdown. And that's a great opportunity for you to give them the hope that you have. Because they're dealing with trauma that they don't even recognize. All right, so I'll keep going. First Corinthians says, I'm aware of nothing against myself and I feel blameless, but I'm not by this acquitted before God. I think that's a, an unusual verse to use. But the, I found this as I was learning about prayer ministry. We don't really call it counseling because we don't charge a fee. There's, there's no cost. If you want prayer in this church, we'll, we'll pray with you. And if you're not here and you need prayer, we'll pray with you too, as long as we have the resources available. So it's not counseling, and it's certainly not psychology. The world's way of, of uh, helping people is to build up self. And Jesus said, crucify self, <laughs> right? So it's a pretty big difference, wouldn't you say? So we have, it is a form of counseling people, but it's not where we you know, are licensed and charge a fees. It's just biblical ministry. We read the Bible. We ask the Lord to help show us what the root systems are. And this is an important one because Paul is just aware uh, that he's not fully aware of everything going on in his life. So he says, I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not acquitted by that. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean I might not have a blind spot. Husbands and wives look at each other. Do you have a blind spot? How would I know? I'm blind. <laughs> to that thing. Can I have permission to tell you when I think you have a blind spot? Yes. I'm not going to make you say it out loud, but it would be a good idea. Because you're not enemies. You're not adversaries. You should value your spouse's opinion even when you disagree. They don't wake up in the morning and say, how can I mess up his life today? What could I say to really offend him? It's like, no, it's like, you, you don't see it, but everybody else does. <laughs> so just because I'm not aware of it, Paul has just given us this really important piece, doesn't mean that something doesn't have to be taken to the cross. And your spouse is a good one to tell you if that's true. And I've certainly benefited from that. In my marriage, I hope Trisha would say the same, that we can help each other. We're here to help each other. I don't want to tear my spouse down. We're one. So, you know, the way you say it definitely matters, right? And, and being kind about it. Speak the truth, but do it in love. So, look, we're going we're gonna to keep fighting this for people all over the world because we're getting you know, prayer requests now from a lot of different places. We know it works, okay? Will it work every single time? Well, I, I haven't had that experience yet, but are we going to still keep trying? Yes, because the resurrection power brings out a different person on the other side of the process. That old man really died, and now there's a new person. What's challenging about that is that you don't know how to live this new life yet because you got so used to that old habit that you became good at it, and there's an expression in the world, the known devil is worse than the unknown devil. You know that one? Because that's how it feels like, well, it might not have been very healthy, but at least I knew how to do it. No, we trust God. You're going to raise up the new me on this side of that, and I'm going to learn quickly because I'm ramped up because your spirit lives inside of me, and the word is true, and I'm going to become that new person in whatever that thing is that I had delivered from. You with me? All right, good. So, First Timothy, I'm so grateful. This is Tim, uh, Paul speaking, uh, kind of openly just confessing that Jesus Christ he made me adequate to do this work. He went out on a limb entrusting me with this ministry. Does anybody else feel that way sometimes? Yeah, not so qualified. And this is the message version, so it's just, you know, kind of plain language. I like it. I'm so grateful to Christ Jesus for making me adequate to do this work. He went out on a limb, you know, entrusted me with this ministry. The only credentials I brought to it were violence, witch hunts, and arrogance. <laughs> not a very good resume for a minister. But I was treated mercifully because I did not know what I was doing. And I didn't know who I was doing it against. And that could bring you back to the road to Damascus. And the light just blinds Paul on the road to Damascus. And, and that was his experience when 
he realized who he was persecuting was Jesus, the Son of God, and it became real. And he says, grace mixed with faith and love poured over me and into me. Anybody have that testimony? Oh, thank you, Lord, that your grace mixed with faith and love poured over me and into me, and all because of Jesus. And then a little stretch here in Ephesians where he's talking about the same thing. It's almost the same language. Same language. This is God's plan for, for this ministry, for this church, for each one of us. This is God's plan that both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news will share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. So if you know people that are struggling, let's say, with addictions, it's an, easy, uh, it's an easy thing to understand that they're really not in control, right? And, and you love them, and you don't want them bound by that. It's like lecturing them and condemning them is not going to help break that thing off, is it? It's showing them a better way. It's asking the Lord, what's the combination to the lock of their heart? Right? That's what Holy Spirit wants to do inside of us, is show us how to approach each person. Because we're all fearfully and wonderfully made. And what worked on Monday with this person won't work on Tuesday necessarily with this person. Because each one of us is different. Sometimes what worked on Monday with this person won't even work on Tuesday with the same person. Right? Because they're in a different mood that day. We'll get into that one. Both are part of the same body. The Gentiles and the Jews are part of the same body. Paul was fighting a big battle here because the Jewish people did not want the Gentiles coming in. At least the religious Jews did not. And, and he had a radical message. By God's grace and mighty power, I've been given the privilege of serving him by people wanting to kill me when I tell them the Gentiles come in. <laughs> right? Like he was getting stoned and just didn't care. He was a courageous man. It's another thing that happens when the Holy Spirit's inside us. We get courage to speak the truth. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, God graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available in Christ. Lord, we thank you right now. Just say it right now. I thank you for the endless treasures available through Jesus, through your word, and through the power of your spirit living on the inside of me. And then we just want to say this. Come, Holy Spirit. Make me more aware of your presence every minute of every day. Man, that's a good prayer. It's a really good prayer. He's just sitting there waiting for you to invite him in to every situation. There's nothing that he's not better at than we are <laughs> in our own strength. <laughs> and then Paul says, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this was to use us, the church, to display his wisdom in its rich diversity and variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, principalities, powers, spirits of wickedness. The church is the body of Christ in the earth. So the way we act should be the way Jesus would act if he was living our life through us. And does anybody think Jesus wouldn't want to live your life through you? Like, oh, well, he wouldn't want to be a plumber. He wouldn't want to be an electrician. He wouldn't want to be a stockbroker. I can understand that one. <laughs> no, there isn't anything that we do. We're made in his image, whoever we are. I mean, you could get convicted that maybe he doesn't want you in a certain job because you might be promoting the wrong thing, but that would be good because he'd give you a better one, amen? He's Jehovah Jireh. I just love this. It says God, God's purpose in all of this that he was doing with Paul was to use the church to display his wisdom. So a lot of us might not have the most incredible backgrounds on paper. You know, we didn't go to Harvard or whatever the world thinks is important. But that's not what matters. It's how, how we allow God to operate through us. It's not based on credentials other than my yielding to the Holy Spirit and just devouring the word, right? I mean, that's part of our effort is to say, I'm making this a priority. Because if I don't have the deposit in there, I can't make the withdrawal. All right, and this was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Jesus our Lord. I'm just giving you a little commentary here because I thought it was really well said. Paul never refers to just the Holy One. He always uses plural. So when he's talking about the body of Christ, it's all of us. Instead of just thinking of one person, think of us corporately as the body of Christ. We all bring something different to the table, right? And he might need what you have in a situation. He might need what I have in a different situation. But we're here to blend together. And that's why COVID is so demonic. 
because it's kept us apart. And like Zoom calls are good, but you know, like, woo, you know, Debbie Downer, man. Like, I think I told you guys said it's like watching a fireplace on TV, all the light, but no heat. <laughs> I thought that was a great description. <laughs> So he always uses the plural because he refers to us as the body of Christ, not just Peter or Trisha or whoever, all of us. And it's too difficult for us to accomplish what God wants us to do on our own anyway, right? So when you build a team in the church, we might not have the most qualifications, but I don't know about you, but I learned so much about how to flourish in business by what I learned in ministry, by what I learned about working together with other people in the church. Because where I was, everybody had, had gone through a real steep, you know, uh, interviewing period, like four or five interviews, and, and there was constantly the threat that if you don't like it here, don't worry. You know, there's plenty of people that want your job, so if you can't live up to what we're asking you to do, nice knowing you. That's how that went, and that put this terrible pressure on us, and now here we are coming together in the church, and you might learn from a 16-year-old kid on your team something that you needed to know, but you never even would have thought to ask him. Ah, God is no respecter of persons, Amen. He shows no favorites. Everybody we look at is a miracle of his creation. And we should just respect them for that. Amen? It's too difficult for us to accomplish what God wants to do on our own. And then it says each of us has to be called and equipped by God. But we also have to be accompanied by other believers who have also answered the call. So someday one person helps you. The other day you're helping them. You're pushing each other on. It's like going to the gym. When you're, when you're doing the bench press, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? When, when you were working out for sports, and if there was a guy behind me, and I was getting to that last rep, all he had to do was put two little fingers under that bar and raise it up, and that's all I needed. And by, you know, a couple more, he was really helping me. But you're supposed to reach that point of failure, right? Okay, so you got my point there. Those who say yes to Jesus become the church, the company of those rescued from darkness and ultimately from death, right? Rescued from the darkness in the natural here, but ultimately rescued from death because we're promised a new resurrected body on the other side. And then I love this. It says, Paul is fond of calling the church the body of the risen Christ. Not just the body of Christ. We're the body of the risen Christ. We're given abilities together that we couldn't do on our own. Look at somebody and say, you're my ally. I'm so glad you got saved. Hallelujah, we're going to be an army together for the Lord. Colossians 2 says, you were buried with him beneath the waters of ceremonial washing, which we call baptism. And then we were raised up with him by faith in the resurrection power of God, who brought him back from the dead. He brought Jesus back from the dead, but many of us know literally how close to death we were and that he resurrected us back out of that old lifestyle. And um, I remember Sam Dueno, who's here, telling me, man, we probably ended up hanging in the same place at one time before we were saved. It was not a good lifestyle. It was too risky. But that's how the devil is. It just sets you up. When your flesh was still circumcised, dead in trans transgression, and swathed in that sinful nature, it was God who brought us to life with him, forgave our sins, eliminated the massive debt that we incurred by the law that stood against us. Anybody relate to that one? Oh my God, if we had to pay the penalty for everything we did wrong, man, there would have been a lot of counts against us in court. And thank you, Jesus. You paid off the massive debt that I had accumulated through my sin, all because you loved me. He took it all away. He nailed it to the cross. But that's not all. He disarmed all those who once ruled over us. He took their arsenal away. Those who overpowered us. Like captives of war, he put them on display to the world and show his victory over them by means of the cross. And it comes down to this. Since you've been raised with the anointed one, the liberating king, keep setting your mind on him and on heaven above. You know, we have a tendency to look at people in the world and judge them. If I say the name Harvey Weinstein, you all know why I'm saying it, right? The thing that he's known for is a horrible thing that happened to him, and he was making all kinds of money. But what if there was a Christian on his team that got him saved? You think he still would have done that? No, so part of it should also be looking at us and saying, Who's, who are the Christians inside these corporations? And let's help empower them. Let's pray for them. Let's become their intercessors. 
Because God loved that guy, still does, loves Harvey Weinstein. He loves us all. And even though it, it translates into horrendous behavior for some people, but for the grace of God, hello? It's any one of us, so who are we to look down on them? Like, that couldn't happen to me? Don't say that. You don't know that. I don't think it would, but don't go there. Amen? I'm almost done. I'm going to jump actually to the, uh, to the Old Testament and just give a, a, a thumbnail sketch of a story that uh, actually Mario Murillo was the first one that helped me see this many years ago. And it might be new to you, so just bear with me and you'll understand, I hope, why. I'm using it as an example of the hope that we have, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. The way we live our lives. Is life difficult? Yes. Even, you know, any, any version of it you want. But then to also live a godly life in a secular world is difficult. Right? It's not the shortcut way. The shortcut way is just to go along with whatever the world is telling you to do. But, boy, you pay for that later. Believe me when I tell you. So, nobody's saying it's easy. But we are getting equipped and empowered by a supernatural presence in our lives that makes it easier if we submit to it. Alright, so here we are. Josiah was eight years old. This is 2 Kings 22. When he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the sight, in the eyes of the Lord, sorry, and followed completely the ways of his father David. So, right? He's a descendant of David. He's in that kingly line. And it says he followed completely. That's, that's a big deal. Because many of the other kings did not, even though they were related to David. He didn't turn aside to the left or to the right. And Hilkiah the high priest, this is verse 8 in that same chapter, and she said to Shaphan, I found a book of the law in the house of the Lord. If you remember, they were doing renovation work because it was a mess. And as they were digging through the rubble in the temple, they found the book of the law. And it says, Shaphan the scribe showed the king, who was the king? Josiah showed the king. Hil Hilkiah, a high priest, gave, has given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king, and it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Right? Anybody can relate to that? I see some heads nodding. When you first became a Christian, and you read what the Bible was telling you, and you hadn't read it before, it's like, oh boy, i got to make some changes. <laughs> I never learned that rule. I didn't know that was a, a violation. And, and all of a sudden, he tears his clothes, which was a way of saying, I need to repent. This is a bad situation. I'm the king. And if what was just read is true, that means I've got to make some very big changes in my life. Now, he doesn't ask us. The Lord won't ask us to do that in our own strength because you can't do it in your own strength. The reason it's a stronghold is because it's controlling your behavior. But God doesn't want it in there. So we don't just fix it, right? We kill it. You have to crucify that thing. You have to take it to the cross. And not to discourage you, but he said, "Go." you have to pick up your cross daily. Not his cross daily, my cross daily. So there's probably something in there that could still benefit me if, if it goes. Hallelujah. I know that's not a good hallelujah kind of verse, but once you start to realize the changes that get made through Holy Spirit living in you, you do. It's like, okay, God, I'm okay with you showing me what has to go next. Sorry, I'll go finish this part. So something was read in that book that made him tear his clothes, which meant he was grieved and he had to repent for something. And I just said, well, here in, in 1 Kings 13, all the way back, many chapters before what we just read, I just said, what did he read? And it's speculation, right? But this could have been what he read because it was many chapters before that. So it's a different scene many years before. Behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam, who's a wicked king, stood by the altar to burn incense. And then this prophet cried out against the altar the word of the Lord. You picturing it? So a man of God comes, we don't get his name, he sees decadent behavior going on in the kingdom, and now he's going to prophesy a word against this idolatry, basically what was happening. And this prophet says, O oh, altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David. And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. <laughs> That's not a popular word, is it? <laughs> so prophets are courageous people because they have a fear of the Lord. 
much greater fear of the Lord than the fear of man and what man can do against me. And, and if you know that the Lord is telling you this and you don't do it, he's not real happy about that. Right? So we have to be obedient to what God is saying. So now here's this young man who's the king, and he's reading what was written, and it specifically names him in the Bible that he would be the one that would tear down these altars. That gives him this mission statement for his life. And when you come out of the grave, you're, you're resurrected into a new mission statement for your life. And that older version of you that was corrupted had to go. It's not fixed. It's crucified. And then we come up resurrected on the other side. And I'm not trying to scare anybody about any of this stuff because you really are a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things pass away and all becomes new. Even though initially, like let's just use guys and cursing as an example, right? This is something that happens all the time. A guy gets saved and now that he's in, in with other believers, he might drop an F-bomb once in a while, but I, honestly, not on purpose, don't even realize they're doing it. Right? And you would say, well, that's not a good thing, but you don't want to get legalistic with people either. It is not a good thing. It's, it's a sin, but if you're only saved two days, wow. you know, let's just cut somebody a, a break and just put an arm around their shoulder and say, hey, let me just show you. <laughs> that's a violation. <laughs> I know you don't realize, but you've got to ask the Lord to help you not to do that. And you're not disqualified because something like that happens, but you still carry some old habits with you into the kingdom. But nobody here is going to judge you, and if they do, you let us know, okay? Because everybody here is one of the inmates in the asylum, all right? Like, we all have something that we're, we have to apologize for on a pretty regular basis. And if I start calling people out for stuff, like, I know you probably heard me say it, but there's new people. Jerry Kaufman, I always think of him. He was on, in the Bronx, and he got saved out of heroin, and it was a really rough area. Prostitutes right on the street in front of his church. And people used to get offended when the prostitutes would come in because they obviously were, were, it was during their working hours because they weren't wearing much clothes. And the, and the religious people were getting all offended. He's like, what do you think? He's going to clean them up and then bring them in? That's not how it works. Once the Holy Spirit comes in, they don't want to do that anymore. So who are we to judge them? If they're coming in, that was the, the sign that they wanted to change. And look, all I'm saying is just think of Josiah. Think of reading your name in the book. Maybe it never happened to you yet, but believe God, as you study it, your, your mission is going to be ever clearer of how you should live the rest of your life. Because you can't look in the rearview mirror and say, oh, look at all the mistakes I made. I'm such a wretch. Why would he love me? Stop. Don't say things about you that he's not saying about you. He's saying, unconditionally, I love you. 24-7, you come to me, I will answer. Never off duty. He doesn't need a vacation. He's the master of the universe. He's always open for business if you want to talk to your father. Yeah. I'll finish here. This, is, um, this was the, the, the prophet that Huldah, the prophetess, gave to Josiah after that. We're back in 2 Kings 22 now. He had read about himself in the Bible, and now we're back in the present day where he has now started to implement what he read about himself, tearing down those altars. And she says, because your heart was tender, we could stand for this part because this is... I'm going to finish it up. And, and it would be good if you just put your heart, hand on your heart. All right? Because this is, this is really kind of like instructions for us too. Right? Because he just, I believe, read his name in the book. And that put him on a mission. And he was going to tear down those altars. And, you know, Lord, help me in my heart to have my mission. To know what you want me to do. It's not nothing. Okay? Can we just say that? I know that's not good grammar. But the mission is not to sit around and do nothing. He wants us to do something for him, but he wants it to be in a zone where you're very effective at it, because then you'll flourish. So, he's, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord. So that could be a good prayer for us. Lord, give me a tender heart that I might be humbled before you. She says, when you heard what I spoke against this place, this is the Lord speaking to him through this woman. When you heard what I spoke against this place, against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. All right? So all we have to worry about is our assignment. 
Yes, we're in body of Christ. Yes, it's not just king of kings. It's the body of Christ. We don't put down other churches that do things differently than us. We're all doing this work together. Not a cult. I get it. Not a cult. But Christian people, stop messing with God's bride. If they're another church and they believe in the Bible and people are getting saved, don't can't say, well, you know, I, I don't even want to say it. It's not right. Pray that they have a revival. And if and your way of thinking is right, then the Lord will show them. Maybe he'll show you something too, amen? We all can have that. So let's just say it out loud together. Lord, give me a tender heart that I could be open to your ear. I'm sorry, your voice. Thank you, Lord. I want to know my mission and feel like I'm empowered through your spirit to accomplish everything you have for me to do. All right, just pause for a minute and, and ask the Lord to show you not all the steps, the next step. What's the next thing he wants you to do? Maybe you have to go forgive somebody. Maybe you have to lay your offering down and go make right with somebody else because it's going to hold you back. Your prayers could be hindered in a situation like that. So, Lord, we're just grateful that you love us and you want to use us. Help us take the limitations that we put on ourselves off and have that tender heart that Josiah had. And I'm going to finish with Romans 8. It says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. Raise your hand if that's you. <laughs> For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, say it, Abba, Father, that's Daddy, that's a, that's a very intimate word that we can use. We've been hearing about that all morning, right? The intimacy with God, Abba, Father. And then maybe here's another prayer that we could say, Lord, help me. Change my image of you from an angry father to a loving father. Let that one sink in not going to go look for somebody to help you if you think they're angry at you and they don't like you. Your father loves you unconditionally. And he wants you to love yourself. Amen. Yeah, we cry out, Abba, Father, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, we will also be glorified together with him. Thank you, Lord. And that suffering means just having to resist temptations. It means having to put your flesh down. It means telling your flesh when you go to fast, you're not going to die today because you didn't have breakfast. You know how it starts whacking, quacking in your ear like, oh, no, you're going to faint while you're driving because you didn't have breakfast. Just tell it to be quiet. <laughs> so I'm, let's just get this posture of, of we receive it, Lord. We receive your word. We're all like Josiah. We're all people that want to see where our name is written in the book. And we want to know that there's a commissioning going on for our lives. That we're not just here to take up space until you come back. But you told us to occupy until you come back. And we want to be effective in doing that while we're here. And Lord, I pray that we could all look at each other as allies. That iron can sharpen iron that everybody has something to contribute to this and we don't pull rank on each other. The greatest title is serve. The greatest thing is to be a servant, Lord, and, and that's, that's how we want to prosper in your kingdom. So, Lord, just say, welcome, Holy Spirit. I welcome you into my heart to show me my commissioning today. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sorry, I ran a little late today, but I do want to just say, if there's somebody here who doesn't know the Lord, maybe a friend brought you and you're a visitor, you've never accepted the Lord and invited him into your life, we want you to come down to this altar and, and invite him into your life. My wife and I both said the same thing. When we didn't know the Lord, we reached a point where we said, what do I have to lose? My life was going off the rails, and I gave him a chance, and he met me right where, he, right where I was at. It's amazing how he does that. And you might be thinking, no, I made too many mistakes. He couldn't love me. I thought that too, but he does. Take it by faith that he loves you and invite him into your heart. So church, let's just say a prayer together, okay? Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I heard that you love me today. I didn't believe that, Lord. But I ask you for the faith to believe it and to receive you as my Lord and Savior. I repent from my sinful ways. 
And I ask you to give me the strength to turn from those habits and turn towards you. I ask you to fill me with your spirit. Help me understand your word that I could follow you as your disciple all the days of this life and forever in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm believing by faith somebody said that prayer for the first time, whether it's in this room or somebody watching online. It's the best decision you could ever make. So if you never made it and you made it today, there's a party going on in heaven. I promise you that. There's a party going on in heaven, and you just got yourself a whole new arsenal that you can use in the, in the fight against evil. I bless you all to go and have an awesome day together and just keep praying for the church, praying for the body of Christ that we could see his, like Trisha said, a revival come to this region. That's our hearts to see it happen. Have an awesome day. Love you.